Good morning, brothers and sisters. How is everyone? Happy July 4th. Happy Independence Day. Today we get to celebrate freedom. Freedom from sacrifice. Which is funny because the only way that that even makes sense is from a Christian worldview. That freedom in Christ comes from sacrifice, which comes from Christ. We have much to do in the book of Nehemiah today, brothers and sisters. We have much to do. Let me go ahead. I should pray for us. We're going to be in chapter 8 again. This time we're going to see the response of the people from hearing the word of God. So let me go ahead. Let me pray. We'll recap and then we'll get into our text. So Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are, for what you've done for us. Lord, we thank you for your gracious gift of providence. Lord, I pray that we would love our communities. We would love our state. We would love our cities. We'd love our state. And Lord, yes, even we'd love our nation. That we, Lord, would be like gospel heralds that would send, the, that would proclaim the gospel to everyone that we would come in contact with. And Lord, you would bless uh, the preaching of your word. Lord, hide me behind the cross. Lord, I pray for, uh, for our text this morning that we would see you risen and glorious. It's in your good name. Amen. So, per usual, let's go ahead, let's recap where we've been and now where we're going. So, Nehemiah, for those of you who are just joining us, God calls this man, Nehemiah, to go build a wall, to rebuild the city of God in Jerusalem. God was with him. The hand, the gracious hand of God was upon Nehemiah. But he, he helped him through adversity, through men like Sanballat and Tobiah that would seek to destroy the work of God. Uh, last week, a couple weeks ago, the genealogies of the people got read. Basically, the whole, the whole deal of Nehemiah rebuilding the wall was not just to rebuild a wall, but to have the people of God worship God. So that's what that was. Last week, we talked about the law of God being read. So Ezra the priest gets up, the whole assembly, he reads from morning until midday, and that was a long sermon. And I'm just saying, he sat for, he, they stood in the heat of the day from early morning until midday. It was not that long. I had a buddy of mine preview my sermon last week, and he was like, you preached for 50 minutes. I'm like, yeah, and? I'm like, <laughs> so he's like, that was a long time. I was like, it didn't feel that way, but uh, I mean, they sat in the heat. He was, he was podcasting with earphones, walking through a grocery store. I was cracking up. It was funny. So here's where we're at. We're going to be in verse 9 in uh, Nehemiah. And we're going to finish this whole chapter. It is small print right now. You do own a Bible, hopefully. We will get bigger text when we go through this, but I want to read the whole passage right now, and then we will pick this apart. Sound good? Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. And Nehemiah, who was governor, and Ezra the priest and the scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said, said to all the people, This day is holy before your, the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet wine. Send portions to anyone who has nothing. Ready for this day, for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. All the people went their way to eat and drink and send portions and make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. On the second day, the heads of the fathers of the house of all the people with the priests and the Levites came together to Ezra the scribe in order to study the words of the law. They found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month and, 
and that they should proclaim it and publish it in all their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out into the hills and bring branches of olives and wild olives, myrrh, saw, a palm, and other leafy trees to make booths, as it is written. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof and in the courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the square of the water gate and in the square of the gate of Ephraim. And all the assembly of all those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in booths from all the days from Jeshua, Yeshua the son of Nun to the day the people of Israel had not done so. And there was great rejoicing. And day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. They kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the rule. The word of the Lord, brothers and sisters. Let's break this down. Let's break down from chapter, uh, verse 9 to 13 and see what is going on here. One, I want to just give you a, a 30,000 foot view, like you're riding in an airplane. What's going on here? So the Levites have just read and explained the law of God to the people of God. They are cut to the heart when they hear the law of God. The work, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, brothers and sisters, separating joint and marrow and the heart and spirit. The word of God has done much work on these people and they are crying out before God. And they're told not to grieve, which is very peculiar. And we'll get to that here in a moment. And because this is a celebration of the work of God and they're celebrating something called the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. So I want to ask a few questions of this text. One, why are they told not to grieve? That's very interesting, very, um, very peculiar, don't you think? They're cut to the heart with the word of God and then told by the people of God, don't grieve, today is holy. Now, I want to say this. It's not that it's, that it's inappropriate to grieve when you're cut to the heart by the word of God. That's, the word, that's what the Word does. The Word of God exposes the character of God. It exposes, this is something that is, let me be totally blunt with you guys. Something that we don't talk about enough is the holiness of God. We don't talk about how holy God is. God is categorically different than us. God is holy. That is his number one attribute. The number one attribute, if you're looking at theology proper, the number one attribute of God is his holiness. God is pure and glorious and wonderful and perfect. Guess what we are? Not holy, not perfect, not these things. So the, wor the word of God informs us on who God is, but it also informs us on who we are. This is not inappropriate all the time when we hear the word of God not to be grieved because, I mean, we should be grieved at times. But this time, when the people are told to rejoice, this is a celebration of the Feast of Booths. We'll get to more on this in a few moments. But what I'm wanting to show here is that something I have to set this up before we get into the explanation as to why uh, they were told not to grieve. So one of the things in theology proper to figure out, the, because the Word of God explained, tells us who we are, right? Amen? Amen. Right Good. So the Word of God tells us who we are. And one of the things that the Word of God tells us is that we're totally depraved. We have this thing of sin has affected every aspect of human life. Um, a good analogy, and many of my uh, theological heroes have used this analogy, sin enters into our being, it corrupts everything that it touches. It's much like when you put a drop of uh, dye into water. You see the first picture? The first picture of like red dye dropping in water? It's not contained. The first picture gets the second picture, right? The first picture of sin entering into our minds, into our bodies, sin corrupts everything. It's not like a pebble. So the difference of this would be like a pebble. So you take a, a glass of water, you throw a pebble in there. Oh, the pebble's right here. I can just pick that out. No, sin has affected everything. Our minds, our wills, and, brothers and sisters, our emotions. Sin has affected our emotions. Now, 
This includes the way we feel about certain situations, the way we do not feel about certain situations. I want to make a note here about our society. Our society thinks all negative emotions are looked at as bad. Whenever someone feels sorrow about anything, we do anything and everything to make them feel better. Everything from giving them drugs, to giving them counseling, to telling them it's okay. Like, society thinks just because we have negative emotions or just because sorrow, sorrow over something, sometimes sorrow is not a bad thing. To be totally honest with you, sorrow, like, we have... uh, in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, it says, For godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. I think it's very interesting when we're talking about this thing of sorrow. How many of you guys have ever read the book by Huxley, Brave New World? Have you ever read that? Interestingly enough, in this book, he's talking about a utopian society, which is kind of weird. If you read that book, it kind of feels like what's going on right now. It's kind of creepy, actually, to be totally honest with you. Uh, same thing with 1984. I'm like, <laughs> violent, ex- you've been exposed on Facebook, you've been exposed to violent extremists. I'm like, I haven't seen that, so I'm assuming they're talking about me. So, uh, point is, in Huxley's book, he actually talks about this fictitious drug called Soma where they would give people, a, like, they would start feeling something negative, they'd pop a pill, and they'd be right back to where they were. It's very weird that our society views anything negative emotions, any type of sorrow, as a bad thing. And like we just seen, it's not. Biblically, sorrow can be a good thing. I want us to see this. And with sin... So here's, here's the reality of the situation. We feel sorrow over things. And sometimes we feel sad when we shouldn't feel sad. We feel conviction when we should not feel conviction. Our emotions are, the, our emotions are broken, right? Uh, I want to say this. Sometimes when we, because of sin, the heart of a person can feel conviction when there is no conviction. Some people have really overly tendered conscious, con, uh, tender consciences. I know a guy like this. I know that uh, a friend of mine, when we were in college, uh, he has a very, very, very tender conscience to where he feels conviction of sin when there is no sin to be feel conviction for. He wouldn't jaywalk. He wouldn't any, anything. He, he won't even cross a street when there's like, you know how you can cross a street when there's no like traffic thing? You guys ever do that? You walk across, I take a quick look and I huff it over there because like I'm large and can't move very fast and if a car comes by, I don't want to get, I don't want to play Frogger for real. That's not really my thing. I'm quick. I don't want to, I'm not quick. That was a lie. So <laughs> point is, point is, he, feel, he felt conviction about that and would actually walk two blocks around till he found a place where he could cross. Anything, any moral, any gray area, anything, anything that even he thinks could possibly be sinful, he stays away from. I praise God for that, by the way. But his conscience sometimes brings conviction of sin when there is no sin. I remember one time when we were in college, he didn't eat for like three days. I'll explain. The text in Romans that says, if you cannot do anything, cannot do it in faith, it is sin. Right? He heard this text preach. He goes, I don't even know if I can eat in faith. So he didn't eat for like three days. I remember him sitting there. I'm like, are you going to pass out? Are you okay? I remember we were in the student center at Eastern Michigan University. I run downstairs. I'm like, quick, I need a Wendy burger now. I need a Wendy burger, some chili, stat. Like, we got to make sure this, I'm like, and we went through the text. I'm like, you need, I'm like, listen, brother, what's happening is your conscience, like, is, oh, it's an overactive conscious here. So what's happened is you're feeling conviction of sin when there is no conviction of sin. And the, let me be honest with you here too. This very important for us when we feel convicted of something to ask why are we feeling conviction and not just accept it 
We need to subject, I'll hammer this point here in a moment more, but we need to subject our feelings to the word of God. We need to ask the question, why? It is not just, it's really important that we do that. Because let me be honest with you, brothers and sisters, false teachers try to emotionally manipulate people to capture them to do whatever they want to. Let me say that again. False teachers use conviction to capture people to make them do whatever they want to. I remember when I was in college, this happened. This happens all over, but this happened to me personally in college. I remember we were sitting around a table and the, we, I was part of a massive campus organization. Uh, God did great things through our ministry. But I remember there was a man there when the emergent church thing happened. Don't Google that. Not worth your time. But basically, we had the question of, can we really believe the Bible? Can we really believe the gospel? And I remember sitting there with my Bible thinking, that's what it says. That's what I believe. It's not rocket science. I'm not smart enough for that. Like, it says it here. That's what we believe. He's like, you're being very arrogant. You're being very arrogant. You can't really know what it says. You can't really know. You can't really know. I'm like, dude, it says it right here. What, 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 what's like complicated about this? The thing what he was trying, I, I had friends, seriously, that were stole, the, the, the friends that when we were in small group together would be like, yeah, this is right. This is what the scripture says. Maybe I'm being arrogant. I feel like I'm being arrogant sometimes. I remember having a conversation with my small group leader. She's like, I feel like I'm being arrogant when I say what the Bible says. I'm like, no, you're not. What was going on with that was our staff worker was actually giving conviction to this person and emotionally manipulating them into, into walking away from the truth. That's the truth. We must look at what the text says. This is, this, this is happening in other areas right now. Um, we have, to ask the, we have to ask the question why. Because let me be honest with you, people try to wield guilt like a weapon. And we need to be aware of what godly conviction is and not just emotional distress. That's really important, especially in right now. Because what our society is doing right now, our society can no longer think logically, so our society just emotes. That's what we do, we emote. I feel like this is a problem. I feel, I feel like this is a problem. And we don't intellectually take that captive. We should actually take every thought captive and make it subjective to Christ. Because here's the reality of the situation too. And I'll give you a converse of this. We even feel happy when we shouldn't feel happy. So it's not just negative emotions. People feel happy in their sin. People feel happy when they should be remorsing. So it's not just negative emotions of uh, sadness. All of this to say is we need to subjugate our emotions to the word of God. God gets to command how we feel about certain things. God gets to command how, we, uh, how our emotions work and things like that. Amen? Does that make sense? Amen. Amen. So God gets to determine what we're passionate about. We should be passionate about the gospel. We should be passionate about discipleship. And let me be totally honest with you. I'm not a perfect human being at all. Massively flawed guy. I don't always feel passionate about the things that God make, tells me I should feel passionate about. And it's to my shame, brothers and sisters. I want that to sink in. I want us to feel that. I want us to know that we should, we should be passionate about the things that God is passionate about, about proclaiming the gospel, about discipleship, about fellowship amongst one another, amongst our Christian brothers. Amen. We are family in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We are family. We should love one another. We should care for one another. We should be informed by the word of God. We should hate, we should love what God loves and hate what God hates. Sin and false teaching and those things. I'll give an example just to, just going with this. That you know in certain, certain laws in the Old Testament, God commands Israel not to feel remorse when they pass judgment on someone. I want you to think about that for a quick sec. <laughs> Like, there are certain laws in the Old Testament where God commands people to say, you will not pity that person. 
You will show no pity, no anything. And we think, wow, that's really mean. That's really mean. No. Commands like somebody that's murdered someone or somebody's turning your heart away from God. In the Old Testament, this is not the example I was going to use, but in the Old Testament, even if your, your child or your wife or your husband was to try to turn your heart away from God, you were the first person with the stone. I want you to think about that. God is holy. We must love God more than we love everything else in this world. Father, mother, son, daughter, spouse, anything. We must stoke that white hot worship for God. Check this out in Deuteronomy 19, uh, 11 to 13. If anyone hates his neighbor and lies in wait for him and attacks him, strikes him fatally so that he dies, and he flees into one of these cities, then the elders of that city shall send and take him there, and hand him over to the avenger of blood, so that he may die. Wow, it's capital punishment, man. Your eye shall not pity him, but you shall purge the guilt of innocent blood from Israel, so that it may be well with you. God, in this case, is commanding emotion. And that, to be totally honest with you, is very hard for us to grasp. Because... To be totally honest, I don't think we do a very good job in, as a society and as a whole in managing our emotions in a godly way. I think that's part of discipleship that's vastly neglected in, vastly neglected in the church, vastly neglected in society. Vastly, all of evangelicalism. All of evangelicalism. We get more excited about certain like song lyrics that have nothing to do with Jesus when we should... Like I was listening to the Christian radio station and some, one thing popped on. I was like, what? It's just weird. Like I seen, I, I Googled it later. I seen this video. Everyone's crying about it. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. So let me go ahead and ask another question of this text. Why are they grieving? Why are they grieving? So they're told not to grieve, but then we have to ask the question, why are they grieving in the first place? Well, this is a symptom of true repentance. It's, their true repentance is actually later demonstrated by their action of keeping the Feast of Booths. We'll see that here in a moment. It wasn't necessarily wrong for them to grieve. It just wasn't the right time. They were told not to grieve, but it's not the right time to grieve. It's a time of rejoicing. It's a time of celebration unto the, unto, unto the Lord their God. Like I said before, the word of God exposes who we are. It exposes who we are before God. It exposes the holiness of God. It exposes our sin. And to be honest with you, it exposes what the punishment for that sin is. These people knew they had not kept the law. Think about that. You're sitting there, you're standing there, sorry. They were standing, and it was probably like 100 degrees out there. They're standing there hearing how bad they are and knowing in their heart of hearts that I don't meet that standard. I don't meet the standard that God has set forth. I have broken that law, that law, that law, that law. And then when they read the punishment of that law, I deserve all of that. Wow, that's not a good situation to be be in. If the story were just that, of course we'd be sad. But there's grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. These people knew that they had not kept the law, knew that they deserved punishment, and they were falling on the grace of God to cover their sins. That's what they were doing. That's why they were emotionally broken. I need God to cover my sins. I need, I don't measure up, and I need Jesus to to, to be a perfect Savior for me. That's what they're feeling in their, in their heart of hearts. It's a symptom of repentance. It's a symptom of true repentance. Now, I want to ask this question. What is repentance? What is repentance? Repentance is a change of mind which leads to a change of action. Change of mind which leads to a change of action. This is why John the Baptist says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Not the fruit is repentance, but the change of mind produces the fruit, right? The apple tree produces apples. The orange tree produces oranges. The fig tree produces figs. The cherry tree produces cherries. The mulberry tree produces mulberries. Like the 
The tree produces the fruit of it. The change of mind produces actions. Now, your actions demonstrate a change of mind. Your actions demonstrate you actually believe something. I want, you, I want you to think about that for a second. Your actions demonstrate that you actually believe something because let me be honest with you, talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. We can talk all day long. I believe this. I don't believe that. When the rubber meets the road is when you, act, when you live it. That we are doers of the word and not just hearers of the word as our dear brother said to us early this, earlier. <laughs> now, let me be honest with you here. Then I'll prove to you that action is dem- belief is demonstrated by action. If I told you right now, I believe there is a gold nugget the size of a car in my backyard buried. Have you dug it up? Nope. No intentions to. I believe it's there, though. You'd look at me like I was insane. You'd be like, there's a gold nugget the size of a card on it? Why do you not have a shovel in your hand? Why are you here? Why are, why, are we not do, why are we not getting a group of us together with a shovel and possibly an excavator? Think about that. If somebody told you they believe something and they don't do anything about it, they don't, I question if they believe it. I remember one time, we were, I was in college, and we were sitting around, we were sitting around having a theological talk. So we're sitting around, we're eating pizza. This guy looks at me with a straight face and says, I believe Christians should be forced to keep kosher laws. I'm like, huh? That's really weird. He's like, yeah, I think the the scriptures teach us we we shouldn't eat pork, we shouldn't eat shellfish, we shouldn't eat any of this stuff. And what was hilarious, you want the hilarious portion about it? We were eating pizza with pepperoni on it. I'm sitting here, I'm like... You're full of it, pal. You don't believe that at all. Yes, I do. I believe it. It's here. I'll give you a theological argument. I'll believe it. I'm like, you don't believe anything you just said. How do you know that? Okay. Let me walk you through this one. Your actions demonstrated you don't believe anything like this because you're eating pepperoni pizza not a genius here, but I'm pretty sure that's pork. That's not what you just said. He's like, wow, you're right. (sighs) He kept eating his pizza and kept on his, kept on, and instead of repenting, he just kept, he pushed the thing. I was like, I'm going to ignore you. (laughs) That's what it was. And let me say this too. Real repentance is different than like a Catholic idea of penance. Penance, you have offended God and you must do something to make God and you even. That's the whole Catholic idea of penance. Like, you, you do something, you go to a priest, you confess it, he gives you a prescription like, like penicillin or something like that. Like, yeah. You need to say five Hail Marys and call me in the morning. No, well, there's no way. Let me be totally honest with you guys. There is no way that you can ever pay God back for anything you've done. You can't. And a system like that, let me be honest with you, the whole system of penance, it makes it on human effort rather than the gospel message of Jesus Christ. There is nothing we can do in our effort and in, in, in and of ourselves to save us. It's all God, all the time. I do nothing. It is all God. Like I said last week when I quoted Martin Luther, and he was talking about the, him at the tail end of Pro, the Protestant Reformation when things, everything had changed. He's like, I preached the Bible, and God did the rest. The same thing with our salvation. God does everything. God saves us from himself, for himself, through himself. Salvation from beginning to end belongs to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, I'll say this too, especially with the whole idea of penance. It produces also ultimately a false gospel. Like every other religion teaches something like this, right? Every other religion basically says, you need to do something to get God in your favor. You need to do this thing to get God in your debt or you need to pay him off or cut him a bribe or something like that. You need to do something. That's not the gospel. 
Every other religion teaches something. Every other religion other than Christianity is works-based. Some of you guys might have been caught in a system like that, where you constantly feel like God is, God is out to get you. He's, uh, I need to do stuff to appease him. I need to do something. I, it all focuses on me. Let me share something with you guys called the gospel. That Jesus lived a life we could not lead, died the death we deserve to die in our place for our sins. This is the good news, brothers and sisters. We don't need to perform penances. We don't need to do what they did in the Old Testament, which was a foreshadowing of Christ. We don't need to take an animal and sacrifice it and cover things in blood, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, because the whole thing in the Old Testament, there's a blood everywhere. That points to Jesus, brothers and sisters. Christ. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. There is nothing you can do to save yourself, make yourself more presentable before God. All you can do is repent and believe the gospel. Now, that is not to say that actions don't are not accompanied with repentance. Repentance produces actions, but that's not what, that we're not putting, the, we need to not put the cart before the horse, right? You put the cart before the horse, the horse it, it doesn't work properly. Now, this is illustrated in the book of James. James says, let me show you my faith by my works. Not that Paul and you guys ever hear that theological thing? Well, Paul says this. I took a Bible as lit class at Eastern Michigan University, which is probably the dumbest thing I've ever done. It was literally it was, it was good in one sense. It was good because I understood what believers unbelievers were saying about the Bible. But in another sense, it was the most frustrating thing on the planet for me. It was super frustrating. I'm like, it says it right here. It just says it right here. That's that's the kind of guy I am. I'm not like I'm not like super like, oh, the philosophical this, that. I'm like, I'm not smart enough for that. I'm just like, it says it right here. I believe it. This, this is what it's, God said it. That settles it. I believe it. There's not much more than that. <laughs> There's just not. But we would have this class and one of my, my professor, Dr. Bob, he was like, we had this whole discussion of like Paul and James. Well, Paul seems to be salvation by faith. James seems to be, says, you're saved by your works. Which is it? He says, let me show you my, like, we're saved by faith alone, but faith is never alone. Check that out. We're saved by faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone, but faith is never alone. James says in that text, he's like, let me show you my faith by my works. You demonstrate, what point I hammered earlier, you demonstrate your belief by your behavior. Like, car-sized gold nugget in Pastor John's backyard. I, I really believe that. You're like, have you dug it up? No, I'm not. Don't believe it. We have to know that. We have to, like, there is a place for works in repentance, but it's a byproduct rather than the thing that gets us there, right? Now, when talking about repentance, we see these people being informed by the word of God and rejoicing in their repentance. Now, there's some stages, let me be honest with you, there's some stages to repentance. I want to walk through these rather briefly. Now, it is important to look at the stages of repentance because God calls everyone everywhere to repent, right, with the gospel. The whole gospel message is well, Jesus did it all. We turn away from our sin. We turn toward Christ. That's what we do. We repent. All the Christian, Martin Luther said in the 95 Thesis, all the Christian life is one of repentance, right? Now, Within, our, within this construct here, first on this step is realize. We realize we're a sinner before God. Your sin brings just condemnation. What's funny is the Israelites in this text knew that. They knew that. That's why they're brokenhearted. That's why they're crying. They understand the holiness of God. They understand their unholiness. And they understand, apart from his grace, I've got nothing. I've got nothing. They understand, they've realized this. They realize their, st their, uh, their stance before God. And let me be honest with you, brothers and sisters, we have a, we have a bad, st we, 
In our own state, we have a bad state before God too. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's every one of us here. Every one of us has told a lie. Every one of us has sinned. None of us will get to heaven on our merits. None of us. And then once they realize, they regret. They regret. They feel the conviction of sin. This is where, uh, this is where the Israelites are right now. They're, they're, they've realized their state before God. They regret their state before God. And let me be honest with you, sometimes this happens almost instantaneously. So it kind of looks the same once you've realized there's a problem, now you're emotionally devastated about it. You guys ever do that? You, the minute you realize there's a problem, you minute there's, you get either, there, there's something emotional that happens. Like you're driving down the highway, you get a flat tire, you're thump, 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 thump. You realize there's a problem. Now you have an emotional reaction about that problem. Usually it's not crying, but anger. Could be crying if you're late for a meeting or something like that. Something super important. But you realize that something is going on and now you have an emotional reaction about that. You realize you realize when you're sitting in there and the doctor comes in with something and he doesn't give you good news. I remember I was sitting with my mom when the doctor told her that uh, she was sick. She realized. She realized that there was a problem. When we realize our sin before God, brothers and sisters, that cuts us to the heart. We show that our, that emotional devastation we feel shows our need for God. Amen? So they realize, they regret, and then they return. They re- you return your heart and your affections to God through Christ. You turn away from your sin and turn toward Christ. Like I said before, repentance is a, repentance is a change of mind which produces an action. This is the action part. You turn away. You have a changed mind. You turn away from your sin, turn toward Christ in the gospel. You do a 180. You do a 180 degree difference. You go from, you go from light, death to life. And this, this births out a resolve to be obedient to the commands of God. This returning, this is what Israel is doing right now. They're returning to the Lord their God. They're hearing the law of God, and we'll see here in a minute, they're seeking to be obedient. And then, once they return, they rejoice. You rejoice at what God has done for you in Christ. Like, this makes us happy. This is the joy of the Lord. Not that we're terrible. Not that, like, not our current, st- we don't rejoice in our current state of, oh, we're terrible before God and all the self-deprecating, all those things. We rejoice in who God is and what God has done for us in Christ. This is what we do. We rejoice at the forgiveness of God. We rejoice what Christ did on our behalf. And I'll be honest, this is totally weird to non-believers. This is totally weird when we tell the gospel to non-believers. You mean you're, you sit there every Sunday morning, have someone tell you how bad you are, and you're happy about it? Yep, in a sense. Tells me how, tells me how bad I am, then tells me how good Jesus is. It's the, it's, it's, the, it's, the how ba- it's the how bad we are and how good Jesus is. That difference is how much we rejoice, to be totally honest with you. Um, and I'll say this too. You don't get great rejoicing without great sorrow of your sin. It's much like a trampoline. So my kids have a trampoline at home. Not a big one. We got a little teeny weeny little tykes one. And my daughter will get on there with JJ, the little teeny weeny little kid. He likes that thing. He sits down there. He bounces. He's cute. He's one. Chrissy is like, she's going to be seven here pretty soon. I have seen her look at him. She was on top of a slide looked at him on the trampoline and was going to jump off like Wiley e. Coyote and launch him, he's one. I'm like, don't even think about it. Don't even think about it. If she would have done this, her inertia coming down, that same force, of do- that same downward force would have produced an upward force. Let me equate that to rejoicing or let me equate that to... Uh, regret and then rejoice. The more we regret our sin, the more we rejoice in Christ for what Christ has done for us. To whom much has been given. Yeah. 
Think about that. Some of, the most, some of the most joyous saints I've ever met have had some of the biggest things forgiven by Jesus. They're rejoicing in it because God has done something for them, in them, and through them. And it's wonderful. It is wonderful at that. So let's look at the next portion of our text. They celebrate the Feast of Booths. They celebrate the Feast of Booths. Let me, let me look at this through here. So the big question here is what is the Feast of Booths? So we see here in our text that they read in the law in verse 13 that they they hear the law and they hear it read with the Levites and the priest and Ezra the scribe and they found it written that people of Israel should should dwell in booths. They should dwell in uh, in tents, in tabernacles. This, This commemorates the exodus where God delivered them out of Egypt, delivered them out of their oppressors, and then brings them into the land. This is a celebration of this. Like, this would be much like how we celebrate Christmas, but not a one-for-one thing. We celebrate the birth of Christ every year. It's a holler, like Easter. We celebrate different things throughout the year, commemorating what Jesus has done in our place and for our sins. They celebrated what God did for them, bringing them out of Egypt. So it's like they set up a tent and they're outside. When I was first reading this, when I was a new Christian, I was like, so it's like a camping holiday? Like, what are they doing here? They got like booths and tents. I was like, this is cool. They could just go to REI and get some. That was supposed to be funny. (laughs) My dad jokes are not nearly as awesome as one of my brothers. (laughs) So what is the Feast of Booths? Let's look at Leviticus real quick, and I'll explain what's going on with this text. In Leviticus 23, I'm going to start in verse 33 to 43, but the important bits on the screen. I just want to set some context so we know what is going on. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of the seven month, for the seven days of the Feast of Booths to the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. That's very important. For seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present food offerings to the Lord in solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim in times of holy convocation for presenting to the Lord of food offerings, burnt offerings, grain offerings, sacrifices, and drink offerings, each on its proper day. Besides the Lord's Sabbaths and besides your gifts and besides all your vows, your vow offerings, and beside all your free will offerings, which you give to the Lord. Here's our text that's on the screen. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered all the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a day of solemn rest. On the eighth day shall be a day of solemn rest. And you shall take all the, and you shall take on the first day of the fir- the first day the fruit of the splendid trees, the branches of palm trees, and brought of leafy trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may be known that I, that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. I've always thought it funny. If during the Feast of Booths, if they went to the restaurant, they clearly couldn't get a table. They had to get a booth. They didn't. <laughs> That's good. Steve's like, good dad joke. I get a tat on that one. That's cool. <laughs> Table or booth? Booth, clearly. It's the Feast of Booths. Some people are going to go out to dinner tonight and be like, we're going to celebrate the Feast of Booths. We just need a bigger one if we have a... Never mind. It's 4th of July. So, <laughs> so point is here, they're rejoicing. This is, this is the reason why they're celebrating before the Lord their God. This is the reason why the Levites looked at them and said, don't mourn. Because look at, in in Leviticus, look at 40. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. They're commanded to rejoice during this feast. 
So even if they were cut to the heart by the word of God, they're like, listen, rejoice for what God has done for us, in us, and through us. Now, I think this is awesome because not only does this feast commemorate the exodus of the people of Israel, this is providential in the book of Nehemiah. What have they been doing this entire time in the book of Nehemiah? What have they been doing? What did God call them to do? And they they worked really hard in doing. Building a wall. Like we talked, this was a lot of material. They worked for 50 some days and built this like eight foot thick wall. Guess what God commands them not to do in this, in the text of Leviticus? Any ordinary work. This is providence that they finished at this time so they could have a Sabbath unto the Lord. This is providence that God worked all of this out for their good and his glory. They get to celebrate unto the Lord what they're doing. This is providential that they're celebrating this feast at this particular time. Now, I want to ask another question. What does this, the demonstration of the Feast of Booths demonstrate? What is this, what is this demonstrate of them keeping this feast? Because it just sounds like they're having a party, right? kind of what it sounds like. It shows that the word of God took root. Their actions demonstrated their belief. Their actions demonstrated their belief. They believe, they heard the word of the Lord, and then they celebrated the Feast of Booths. Could you imagine if they, they heard, hey, we're supposed to celebrate, we're supposed to do this. It's okay. We don't need to. They didn't really believe it. You only be- Like, your behavior dictates your belief. And if your belief is, like, you can trace that back, right? I think this is amazing. I think it's awesome that they heard the word of the Lord, and they're like, yep, first thing we're going to do, we're going to start celebrating the feast. What's the next feast? Boom. Bingo, bango. And they were informed by the word of God, and they acted on it. It showed that this truth, truth be told to, it showed their emotions were not just show. How many times do people show, especially within Christianity, especially within evangelicalism, we show emotion, but there is no sincere heart change afterwards? This happens during missions trips. This happens during uh, all kinds of things. People have spiritual highs and then don't do anything about that afterwards. This, uh, to be honest with you, I get really skeptical when people start showing over emotion. I take a wait and see approach to a lot of things in life. Someone shows great emotion. I love when people come to Christ. I love when people come to Christ, turn, turn their heart away from their sin, turn their heart toward their Savior. I love that. I also take a wait and see approach. If someone says, you know what? I, they just have an overly emotional like, experience. I'm like, okay, let's see. Let's wait. I know uh, a friend of mine grew up in the Pentecostal movement. And this happens all the time. People get really emotionally high about something and don't do jack about it after. I want you to think about that. People can say they've had an experience with Jesus and then get up and keep sinning. That's a problem. That's a real problem. Let us not deceive ourselves just to think that we have an emotional experience that we, didn't, that we had an encounter with the living God. Having an a encounter with the living God changes your life. That would be like me saying, guys, check this out. I was driving to church today and got hit by a truck. I was walking out, you know, walked out, Matt, truck, smacked me right there. Y'all look at me like I was a liar. Because it would be. There would be evidence of what happened. If I said, hey, I got hit by a truck, you'd be like, hey, you're lying because you're alive. That's how that would work. Now, what does this mean for us as I close? One, Because we love the gospel and because we're born again, we want to obey the word of God. Let the word of God take root in our lives. We should be doers of the word and not just hearers. In our, like, it's in our being, we want to be who it says we should be. We want to do what it says we should do. We want to be biblical in our lives, our family structures, our mission. Everything we do should be for Jesus. Amen? We want to be doers of the word. And what does this mean for our church? We want to be biblically on mission. We want to be a great commissioned church that organizes everything we do, 
around the word of God. We want to be Bereans. I want to strengthen that commitment to say that uh, everything we do, the word will be central. That's what we should do. We should look at the word of God. We should love the word of God. Everything as we organize as we organize, as we rebuild the city of God, as we're pushing toward fall kickoff at the tail end of August, everything is going to be word-centric because of the Christ who saved us. Let me go ahead and let me pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for who you are, for what you've done for us at the cross. Lord, I pray that we would be doers of the word and not just hearers. It's in your good name. Amen.